Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the UFC 184 conference call. Today's call is being recorded at this time for opening remarks and introductions. I'd like to go ahead and turn the conference over to Dave Lockett. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you. This is Dave Lockett, Director of Public Relations here for the UFC. I'd like to thank you all for participating in today's conference call for what is a highly anticipated UFC 184 Rousey versus Singano fight card on Saturday, February 28th at Staples Center in Los Angeles. Just a reminder that this is an invite-only conference call, so a live streaming call is uh, prohibited. Uh, the fight card we, excuse me, the fight card we all have been Mark event, and uh, we are also pleased to have participating on the call with us today those four fighters from the main and co-main events, including undefeated UFC women's bandweight champion Ronda Rousey, undefeated women's bandweight number one contender Kat Zingano, UFC bandweight contender Raquel Pennington and making her UFC debut, UFC debut women's bantamweight Holly Holm. I'm now going to turn things over uh, to the call center to get things started. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to go ahead and queue up for a question or comment, please press star, then one on your telephone keypad. If you're yep. on a... Sorry, go ahead, sir. I was say one correction I did make. I did think I said that it was that this call um, could not be uh, streamed. That it can be streamed. So please feel free to move forward if you had planned to do so. Okay. Again, star one, ladies and gentlemen, and we'll pause for just a moment to give everyone the opportunity to signal. And again, ladies and gentlemen, star one for questions. We'll go first to Richard Hunter with KRLD FM Radio. Yes, hi everybody. Uh, a question for Raquel Pennington and Holly Holm. Obviously, this fight was originally scheduled to take place uh, late last year, and uh, it was canceled on about two weeks' notice. Do you, uh, for both of you, do you feel like you're at the same level of preparation that you were at that point last year, or has the layoff given you uh, extra enhanced time to prepare for your opponent in a way that you weren't already uh, prepared? Uh, if I could ask first Raquel and then Holly. Um, when it, you know, when it came to my last fight camp, I had a phenomenal camp. I prepared, I took myself to a whole new level as a fighter and as a person. Um, and within the time from going out and performing against Ashley and then going back into another fight camp, I mean, I feel like it's only made me progress that much more and prepared me to become that better fighter and be even more prepared for the fight that I'm going into next week. And Helen? Um, I mean, for me, <laughs> I felt great uh, going into that fight, you know, already putting so much time into training for a fight and having to pull out. Um, I guess I kind of can understand where other fighters get very frustrated with injuries. It's the first time I've ever had to do that. So um, it has given me more time to put into training. Um, I did have to take the time off from my injury, uh, but I do feel like I was able to put more of 100% in now that I've been healthy. So I do feel like I'm better now than I would have been in December. And also, finally, a question for Rhonda Rousey. Uh, Rhonda, I know your uh, autobiography is set to be published in May. Has the book already been completed, or will we see the events of uh, Weekend After Next included like as a final chapter in the book? Um, me and my sister submitted the first draft uh, right before New Year's, and um, I have suspended working on it at all until after um, after I beat Kat. So um, as soon as I'm done dealing with her, then I will go back to dealing with the book. And um, I'm, really, I'm really happy with that look so far. Um, yeah, 
it's going to be an interesting read. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. And again, star one for questions. We'll go to Dave Debert with Post Media News. Hi, guys. Uh, thanks for the time. Um, Rhonda and Kat, I just wanted your uh, opinions uh, on the company's uh, announcement today to uh, um, overhaul the uh, the drug testing procedures. Rhonda, what uh, you've been fairly outspoken about the subject. What uh, what did you think about the announcement? Uh, well, I'm extremely encouraged uh, of what I, I heard the announcement is. Uh, up until this point, the drug testing that I underwent when I was 16 uh, or even 14 was much more stringent than the drug testing that I got as as a world champion in MMA. But now that they have started the random out-of-competition drug testing for everybody on the roster, um, as well as everybody that competes on every card, it is really starting to become comparable to the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency season. I really think that um, the... USADA is an extremely great model to follow, and I'm also very happy to see that uh, there's going to be third-party drug testing as well. You know, the more testing there is, the better it is, because that means the safer that the fighters will be. All right. Kat? Um, yeah, I think stylists agree to have the, you know, the matchups be as natural and organic as possible is, you know, very legitimate. So I, I don't know. I think it's fair, and it's cool with me. All right. Uh, thanks, you guys, very much. I don't want to film me doing it. <laughs> David Martin with Fox Sports. Please go ahead. Uh, first question is for Rhonda. Uh, obviously, Rhonda, you got to get through Cad Zingano first at UFC 184, but I wanted to get your reaction to you know Dana White kind of joking that you know if you beat Cat. You know, uh, you know, you've kind of cleaned out the division. Obviously, Holly's on the line. You know, Raquel. There's other fighters, but but do you feel like Cat is kind of the last great challenge for you, or are there still other challenges for you at 135? I, no, I, I definitely think that there's there's many more challenges. At this point, Cat is definitely the greatest challenge. But um, Daniel was making a joke that I'm making his job a little bit difficult for him. But um, it's not my job to make his easy. It's my job to give my mom as less stress as possible. <laughs> and so if I went as quickly as efficiently as possible or, you know, I just want to be unscathed. Even the last fight when my knuckle exploded, I spent the whole time after the fight trying to hide my hand from my mother. Um, but, no, there's definitely, I think, a lot of competition at 135, and it's this card is evidence of it. We have women as a main and a co-main event because we have that many high-quality fighters that are worthy of the honor. Yeah. I know when I talked to you last year, you had said that, you know, you were looking to maybe take a little downtime as hard as that is for you to do. Obviously, you had the injury that kind of forced you to take a little time off. But I mean, do you feel refreshed? Do you feel, you know, kind of, you know, kind of refreshed now going into this fight more than kind of that, you know, constant bam, bam, bam streak you had there for a while? Um, Definitely, definitely. I And you have to remember, I pretty much have been fighting all my UFC fights with one leg. And now I I feel better than I did even when I was 16 years old, right? You know, when I got my first knee surgery, and I really feel rejuvenated, like like I just molted or something, and I have a brand new body, and I allowed myself to rest and recuperate. And even my mom, who is like the biggest into working hard all the time, more than anyone you would ever know in your life, was telling me that you need to rest. Your body is telling you something. And I'm very glad that I did because when I, I cleaned up everything in my knee, we found out that I had an arthritic spur literally rubbing on my ACL and it would have ruptured at any time. And so um, we did, we took care of everything just in time. I'm perfectly healthy and better than ever before. And I can just feel my body itching to fight again. And I know you mentioned with the book deal, you know, when you have something coming up, a fight coming up, you put everything else to the side, but it's impossible to ignore the things you have coming up this year with the, the Entourage movie coming out, the Fast and Furious movie coming out. So I'll kind of ask kind of a broad question. How big is this year for you, both career-wise in the UFC and just career-wise in general? Um, well, <laughs> this is kind of a cover, colorful way to say it, but um, if 2014 looks like it was my bitch, then 2015 is going to look like my bitch's bitch. 
<laughs> I love it. I love it. Thank you, Rhonda. No problem. My coach just walked past laughing his ass off. <laughs> We'll continue on to Neil Davidson with the Canadian Press. Yes, thank you. Uh, my question is is to Rhonda and Kat. Uh, you mentioned that, that this card has both a uh, women's main event and co-main event. What do you think the next step is for the women's sport? Uh, uh, more weight classes? Where do you see the next progression? Oh, you go first, Kat. Uh, um... I, I think there's a lot more to see from the the one fifteeners for sure. You know, I think that with the ultimate fighters we got to see how much of spit fighters they can be, but I think um there's obviously a lot more to do with that weight class. Um the phantom weights have been doing really good and progressively gotten better. So, you know, I I think that um we'll probably sit tight for a while. I don't know if they'll open up you know, surrounding weight classes anytime soon. I have I have no idea, but if they do, I'm sure it will be powerful. Um, yeah, I actually agree that um, spending time developing the women's 115-pound division would be the wisest investment of time. I would really like to see them develop the division to a point where they can headline their own card, and I, I think that's entirely possible within the next year or two. Just if I can have a quick follow Rhonda, do you think there will be a time – in the next few years that we'll see an all-women's UFC card? Um, that happen? I mean, it could happen, but I don't really see any reason why it should. I, I don't see any reason why there should be all-men's cards either. Otherwise, unless they just don't have enough fighters, I think that every card should try to appeal to as many audiences as possible, and it doesn't really make sense to, to limit them. Fair enough. Thanks very much. <laughs> We'll, we'll take our food. next question from Matt Jewell with Boston.com. Hi, my question is for Rhonda. Um, you've been an outspoken critic of the Olympics in the past, and uh, I know you used to train in Wakefield, Massachusetts. Uh, I was wondering, what do you think about the Olympic Games possibly coming to nearby Boston in 2024? Do you think the city should like welcome the Games with open arms, and do you see it as even being worth it for the city or the athletes involved? Oh, yeah, I think it would be awesome to have an Olympics here. You know, my, my criticism of the Olympics really comes from the, the treatment of the athletes. I think that all Olympians should be able to have college scholarships available to them and should, they should have some sort of job placement for, for them after they're done. You know, I love the Olympics. I love the idealism behind it, but I think that they need to spend more time thinking about the welfare of the athletes instead of making the corporate sponsors happy. Awesome. And uh, for my last question, I was wondering, the UFC was recently forced to end its uh, sponsorship of the European Judo Championships. Uh, I was wondering, what are your thoughts on that partnership having to end? Why was it forced to end? Uh, I was wondering what your thoughts on it having to end because the the European Judo Union said that they tried to cancel the championships uh, because of its partnership with UFC. I think it's really unfortunate that... um that judo has been so resistant to change and taking advantage of such a huge opportunity to grow their sport, like a partnership with the UFC. And um, I think that USA wrestling is making a lot more wise decisions than judo is. And unfortunately I I believe that judo is going to become a a less and less popular sport as time goes on because of the decisions that they're making have a lot more to deal, do with uh, they're thinking less about what's, best for the fighters, I think, and they're just becoming extremely resistant to change, and anyone that resists change gets left in the past. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Rick Wright with Albuquerque Journal. Hi. A uh, question for Holly. Uh, Holly, I, I think it, it seems obvious to me that, that women's MMA and its youth uh, in terms of acceptance and popularity has already surpassed anything you experienced in 13 years as a boxer. Uh, how exciting and how satisfying is, is that to you as a, as, a, as a combat sports athlete? You know, I'm super blessed and, and super proud of, of everything that I got to experience in boxing, but it is sad that there isn't enough following behind it. If you're a female boxer, you're in it purely because you just love it. 
and I feel like there should be more following behind it. Um, I feel like now that I am in MMA, my my want to come to MMA was just same as in boxing. I wanted to do it because I was passionate about it. And, you know, I did boxing because of passion, and now I'm doing MMA because of passion. But it is amazing to see how much more uh, attention and how much more um, following and support there is with uh, women's MMA. And, you know, I'm I'm just... I'm so happy to be part of it while it is, you know, at at a high. And I think it's going to stay there. I don't feel like it's going to have its ups and downs. I feel like women's boxing has had its ups and downs. I mean, they've had, you know, big fights on television before with women's boxing, and you just don't really see it anymore. But it's had had some times where it's been high. Um, I feel like women's MMA is at a point now you almost can't ignore it. And I think that it's great. I think that it's, uh, you know, what, the athletes deserve. Um, they work just as hard and train just as hard as the men, and I think that it's great that uh, the recognition is out there. And these women have skill. It's not just uh, a cat fight out there. And I think that the more that people watch it, um, you know, the more people are even getting into it because they start to really see uh, what these girls have. Tell me if I'm wrong, but I think he's, he probably has had as many interview requests from outside of Albuquerque in the last seven months as you did in the 13 years uh, you boxed. Uh, I can't say that's. I have to say that's true. <laughs> is is there any negative at all to that in terms of distractions, in terms of focusing, or is it all good? Would you say? Yeah, I'm just trying to take it all in as it comes. I always am in the point where I feel like I just want to ride the wave wherever it goes, and if this is kind of what's happening right now with my career, then great, let's go with it. Um, I definitely have to shut the phone off and just focus on training. Um, but it has been busy, and I'm just trying to make the most of it and enjoy it rather than dread it. Okay, thanks, Holly. Thank you. And Daniel Flynn with Breitbart Sports, please go ahead. Question for Kat and Rhonda. Uh, first, Kat and Rhonda. Uh, we see Rhonda in the swimsuit issue, Sports Illustrated. She's on Verizon commercials. She's writing an autobiography. She's even got going to be in the Entourage movie coming out. Kat, do you think your opponent may be overlooking you with all of these extracurricular activities? And for Rhonda, you said that you wanted to, to make 2015 your bitch's bitch. Is there, is there a chance that maybe, tw- you know, that, that uh, the thing that you're making your bitch will make, you know, will, will, will basically uh, enslave you? Uh, and, and hurt you in, in, in pursuit of the primary goal, which is, which is MMA. Um, wait, what was your question? All the distractions, the swimsuit issue, the Verizon commercial, the autobiography, the movies, all the, all that. Is there? You said you wanted to make this year your bitch. But it, but is there a, a danger that all this is going to make you its bitch? You know that, that basically you're going to lose sight of the, the focus on MMA with all this other stuff in, 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 uh, that you're doing. You said you wanted Cat to answer first. Didn't yeah, you? you said you wanted Cat first, and then but that was not I, well. In my opinion, I think you know. I mean, it, it seems like she's motivated and driven, and and you know doesn't need much idle time and so she goes and accomplishes things that's that's what it seems like to me you know when i set out to try and do things that people say are impossible first they ask me why i do it and then after i accomplish it they ask me how i did it and the reason why you doubt the ability that it could ever be done is the reason why you will never do anything that great so, question on on women's MMA. There have been doubters. Dana White at one time was a doubter, and one of the ways that the doubters have been converted to you know enthusiasts of women's MMA, MMA is that it's been on you know that, that it's been included on the male cards. For instance, the, the Misha Tate uh, Ron for the second fight. A lot of people were won over by that fight. Is there a danger that you have um, headlining you know, two headlining bouts, women's bouts? That's just going to throw off a lot of a lot of fans who might otherwise buy um, buy a, a card. Do you think this is a blessing for women's MMA or a curse that you have women at the top of the card? In other words, is it something that that you guys might actually be harmed by because the pay per view buys may not be what they would be 
uh, if you had, you know, uh, man headlining the card. Is it to everybody? To everyone. Anyone take a shot. <laughs> well, I think it's a it's a great opportunity to be able to prove something. But otherwise, you know, it's, it is what it is. There's there was 46 UFC events last year. You know, and I think that's something like 20 to 30 percent more than they ever did the year before that. And this is not an event by event company or endeavor. You know, this is they're looking at the entire fight as a whole. And there's a lot of factors that that affect pay per view. But you know what? I think that this card is going to perform extremely well. And compared to the guys, I, I think it's going to hang in there and be respectable. And that's why they have enough faith to put us in there. You know, the UFC has been around for more than 20 years. They know how this business works, and they're not going to put together a card like this if they think it's going to fail. Anyone else want to take a shot? Uh, I'd have to agree with Rhonda. I mean, us women, we go out there, and we've already proved enough. Um, Women's MMA has come a really long way. And in my opinion, I mean, just from the people I talk to or the responses that I get and the responses that I see from multiple people just everywhere, I mean, people look forward to us fighting. They get excited when you can have a fight card full of male fights, but yet when that women fight comes on, I mean, that's what people want. They're super excited by it. So uh, I have to agree. I mean, I think that UFC was smart with the choice that they're making, and all of us girls are going to go out there and do what we do and prove why we're out there. It'll be exciting. And people even asking this question, it really proves that the inequality still exists. I mean, that they, if they put up a, a men's 125-pound main and co-main event, people wouldn't be asking the question like, oh, if this doesn't sell very well, we might just get rid of the whole men's division. You know, why are we still even asking this question? Do you, what, do you remember the last time you asked that question to a guy? Well, I, I wouldn't because, you know, MMA is, is sort of a niche sport. And then within MMA, the women's thing, for a lot of, players, for a lot of fans, whether you like it or not, it's, it's a turnoff for, for certain guys. Now, that may be a bad thing that it's a turnoff, but it's a reality, and I just want to get you guys to respond to that reality. I am responding, and you know what? Lighter divisions are a turnoff to some people, but you don't ask them about that, like, oh, well, people don't just want to see heavyweights, da 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 Well, I, I, you know? I actually have, I actually have, I actually have that. Your, your kind of opinion is the thing that we're starting to change. You are what we need to change about this culture. I actually asked a question about the lighter weights to Benson Henderson last, uh, last month, so I have actually asked that question. Last, last point, the last question, the, the, um, on, on the press conference earlier today, and I'm not asking you to name names, but have any of you been in the octagon at a point and you thought that your, your opponent, you're facing off with someone, that they're, ju- that they're juiced up, that they're roided up? You know what? I really don't care. I assumed that a lot during the Olympics. I assumed that every single one of these girls is probably on all kinds of juice, and they've had every single opportunity in the world that I never, ever had. They had better development. They had better coaching. They had better scouting. They have better everything, and I assume that they have every single advantage in the world that I don't, and I use that as as a reason to beat them in spite of it because I need to be better on my very worst day than they could possibly ever be with every single advantage that possibly exists that I don't have. I do the same thing, you know. I mean, I don't sit here. I train against nothing but guys all the time, and then we'll sit there and bring in females, and, yeah, I'll challenge myself because a woman works a different way. But, I mean, I've never been intimidated by any girl that steps into that cage to whether they're on some type of steroid or drug or whatever it may be. I mean, if that's what you want to portray yourself to be afterwards, I mean, the truth always comes out, and it just it puts that damper on your career and – what you look like. I mean, we're all professional athletes and you should handle your career as a professional and do things. But I mean, I take it for what it's worth and I do pretty much what Rhonda does. I'll build my opponent up to the fullest to where when I'm in the gym and I'm training, I mean, I want to get in there. And when I know I beat you, I beat you at my worst, which you brought out my best because you had to go over and beyond to try to beat me. I think that a lot of times if anybody out there, if I feel like they have been on, you know, any kind of performance enhancing drug, for me, I feel like they might not mentally be as strong because they feel like they have to go there in order to be better. And so for me, I think I'm just going to do it naturally because then I'm going to have mental confidence that I know this is really me and this is me at my best. So 
sometimes if I, I guess I haven't really thought about it, but if they are, I just feel like they might be mentally weak because they feel like they need help. So for me, that's kind of where my mental edge comes from on that. Thank you so yeah. much for answering. Thank you again, yeah. Star One, for questions, ladies and gentlemen. Kendrick Johnson with Source Magazine. Please go ahead. Go ahead. Um, my question is for Rhonda. Uh, Rhonda, um, how, how much of a dream is it to be headlining at Staples since it's like your backyard? Is that a big deal that you're headlining, or are you just happy to be fighting there? Or was that one of your goals coming into M&A? Uh, oh, it's a specific goal because it's one of those things that I can't really control. But it is kind of cool that I drive past the Staples Center to the gym every single day. And, like, there's a rotating billboard, you know, like one of those electronic ones, but it shows, like, all the stuff that comes on for the year. And, like, as I'm getting on the exit to the, the 110 North, I'm, like, waiting for it. I'm, like, maybe this one, maybe this one, maybe this one. And if it comes up and it has me and Kat, you know, on, on the billboard of the Staples Center in front of everybody, got it, everyone that drives past, you know, I, like, I, you know, I can't jump up because I'm driving, but I point with my hand. I'm, like, yeah, I want to win. You know, I, I yell inside my car, and I just hope that if anyone tends to look over, they think I'm singing you know, really awesome song um <laughs> but it is nice it is pretty cool and so um um it'll be an easy drive which is nice <laughs> and can you comment on you, you talked about how resilient cat is how she's came back in um a couple of her octagon fights uh what's going to take to to finish her since you're since you got the 100 percent finish rate right now <laughs> Um, you know, I never plan out exact game plans for fights. I just walk out and I solve the fight as it happens. So I know that Kat brings so many weapons to the table that I will be ready to deal with every single one of them. And that's what makes it such an exciting fight. There isn't one clear cut way to go to finish it. And so I, I really think that's what makes it exciting. You don't know where it's going to go, but I could finish it anywhere and I will find a way. And this question is for Kat. Um, you've gotten off to a couple of slow starts in your um, match with Misa and your last match. Is there anything you're going to do any different to not come off so slow, or are you just going to rock the way you usually do? No, you know, I, I know that I figure it out. You know, every time I figure it out, these last couple of starts, I had some, uh, there's a lot going on, but, you know, I always know that I go out there and I, I make it work. So, um, you know, my fight with Amanda, I, I wouldn't have considered it a slow start. I just, I went close to her, tried to throw her, and I split, so I ended up on bottom for a minute. But it didn't matter. I worked it out. And I, I don't know. I'm I'm a bigger, better fighter. I get better every time, and that's what I plan on doing. And my last question is, uh, for, this is for Kat, too. Uh, what, what is it going to take to beat Ronda? Because nobody's been able to, to find the, 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 solve the, the, the rowdy code. Uh, why why do you have the tools and what's it going to take to be the one to solve the puzzle that nobody's been able to solve so far? Well, I'm different. I know I know she knows that. I know the whole promotion knows that. I have things to offer that you know people haven't seen before, and it's just, you know, I just have to be me. I have to do me, go out there with my intensity and my aggression, and, and I'm unstoppable. I know that. Uh, thanks, ladies, and see you all in L.A. next week. Good luck. And we'll go to Jeffrey Harris with 411 Mania, Mania MMA. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. First question uh, for Raquel. Raquel, what is it like to be a part of uh, the co-main event of an all-female MMA uh, main event and co-main event on pay-per-view? And um, you're, you're definitely the underdog against Holly Holm, but I think you know this is a great opportunity for you to be in this fight. You know, it's exciting. I mean, I kind of try to just put everything off when it comes to it. Uh, the same thing I did with Ultimate Fighter. I mean, everybody made it such a huge hype with um, the my season. I mean, us being the first women in the house and whatnot. And, I mean, if you put that pressure on yourself, uh, it, it kind of plays a part. So when it comes to it, I mean, I feel like regardless if I'm the co-main event due to Holly type train and stuff, I feel like, my hard work's actually paid off, and I deserve to be there. I'm not your fighter that goes out and does everything I need to in the media's face, but, I mean, I sit here, and I feel like my hard work's slowly paying off. Um, what was hey, the your question? Uh, my next question is for Kat. Uh, for Kat, you're definitely uh, – a lot of the uh, betting sites have you at about plus 800 uh, as the underdog for your fight against Rousey. Do you think a lot of people are maybe underestimating you uh, for this fight, or do you not mind that position? 
No, I don't mind. You know, I mean, it, it's what do I have to lose? You know, I, I'm going out there and I'm I'm at the top. There, there's no one higher to go, and I'm just I'm I'm just pumped to be here. And um, being the underdog, man, I I like that. I I do. I think that it gives me a lot that I want to prove and a lot I want to show, and it it forces me to be authentic and to pull out my best stuff. So I think it's I think it's fun. And uh, last question for Rhonda. When you see Kat fights against Misha and Amanda, what do you think of her toughness and, and how she was able to overcome some hard first rounds and, and come out with the finish in both of those fights in exciting fashion? I think that Kat's resilience is one of the things that has really impressed me about her most, and I think that's what's really gotten her uh, most of her fans. It's not just the way that she fights, but the way that she endures. And... Um, it's extremely impressive and one of those things that I will definitely keep in mind for the fight. She's not one of those people that can be intimidated, so I won't even bother. She's not one of those people that can start losing a fight and you can count on them being a front runner and defeating themselves. She's one of those people that has to be finished all the way until the very, very end. And I'm ready for that. I'm ready for a five round war if it needs to be that way. And I'm still going to be the, fi- the better fighter that night regardless of what happens. Thank you all very much, and congratulations on the event. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, with no additional time for questions, I'll go ahead and turn things back over to David Lockett. Thank you, and uh, we'd like to thank Rhonda, Kat, Raquel, and uh, Holly for their participation. Uh, Just a reminder to all media that UFC 184 takes place uh, next Saturday, February 28th at Staples Center. Uh, Fight Pass prelims will begin at 4 p.m. Pacific time, followed by the uh, prelims on Fox Sports 1 at uh, 5 p.m. Pacific time, and the main card on pay-per-view at 7 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, We will release the full fight week schedule over the next couple of days, so please keep your eyes out for that schedule. Uh, Again, thanks to everyone for their participation in today's call, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Sounds good. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you. And again, ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude today's conference. Thank you all again for your participation.